Hi, sweet friends. This is Mary from marysnest.com and author of the Modern Pioneer Cookbook. Today I'm sharing my holiday cooking marathon with you, which includes all my best Christmas and New Year's recipes. So let's get started. Hi, sweet friends. Welcome back to Mary's Nest. Today I'm continuing with my Christmas cooking series and I'm making an orange marmalade ginger glazed ham. It's also got lots of wonderful spices that not only taste delicious but are going to fill your kitchen with a wonderful Christmas aroma. Well, what I've got here is an eight and a half pound ham. It's already pre-cooked and it's spiral sliced and it's bone in. And I bought this at my local grocery store. And the reason I picked this one, they had all different varieties, but this was a fully cooked, hickory smoked, uncured honey ham. So it's not cured. It has no nitrites, no nit nitrates. <laughs> Uh, no antibiotics used ever and uh, never fed animal byproducts, no artificial growth hormones used, no artificial ingredients and no preservatives and it was raised on a family farm. Now I'm going to move this to the side and I'm going to show you the pan that I have prepared to warm this up in. I'm just going to push this to the side. The paper has a lot of crinkling to it. And I think I already mentioned it's an eight and a half pound ham. So what I've got here is a baking sheet and I've lined the baking sheet with aluminum foil and then I put another piece of, of aluminum foil on top that I'm going to wrap the ham in while it's warming up. And the reason I do this is sometimes the, the um, aluminum foil that I wrap it in can leak a little when it's warming up and especially when I go to add the glaze a little later once it's warmed and having that extra insurance of that uh, additional aluminum foil on the baking sheet makes cleanup a lot easier, especially since we're going to be using jams. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to get that unwrapped and put it on here, wrap it up and get it in my oven and let that warm and come up to temp and then we'll talk about the glaze. I just wanted to show you this hair because it's just so glorious looking before I wrap it up and, and put it in the oven, but it's really, it's just a, a beautiful ham. And the reason I like making this during holiday season, especially on Christmas Day, is because it's really low maintenance. It's already been cooked. It's spiral sliced. I just wrap it up, stick it in the oven, 350 degrees for about an hour, hour and a half. It'll warm it through, take it out, put the glaze on, put it back in the oven for a few more minutes at 425 and it's just, it looks stunning, it makes a great presentation and really you didn't have to do very much. So I highly recommend making this on Christmas Day or New Year's Day or, or any day that you want to have a nice celebratory meal but not something that's very time intensive and it'll keep you, keep, that will keep you in the kitchen and away from your guests. This way you put it in and you can enjoy your party. Now while the ham is warming in my oven, I'll show you how I make the glaze. And what I do is I use one jar of orange marmalade and this is a 12 ounce jar and this one is actually orange marmalade with champagne. Ooh. <laughs> It was the only one I could find in my grocery store. But that was the, the, so that's the orange marmalade. And then the other one is a ginger preserves. And this also was the only ginger preserves that they had at my grocery store. Now, if you can't find ginger preserves, don't worry. You have a couple of options. If you can find um, crystallized sliced ginger like this, which I actually found in the produce section of my grocery store, but you may also find um, sliced ginger uh, in the candy section. So just look around and see what you can find. This is eight ounces. And if I was using this, I would whirl it with the orange marmalade, like in a blender or a food process or something to just kind of break it up. And if you don't have that, then just try and um, either of those pieces of equipment, just try and uh, chop it as, up as much as you can with a knife and then add it to your orange marmalade. And then we've got a couple of nice spices that we add in. I've got a half a teaspoon of cloves, I've got a half a teaspoon of cinnamon, and I have a half a teaspoon of ground ginger for a little extra punch of ginger flavor, and then I have two teaspoons of dry mustard. I like using this because it's got a nice, nice strong flavor to it. If you don't have this, don't worry. Just use uh, two tablespoons of a spicy mustard, something like a Dijon, um, or anything you have along those lines that might have a spicy flavor to it. It really helps uh, 
accentuate, sort of offset the, the sweetness. It's a nice balance of sweet and spicy with the jam. So, but, so that's two teaspoons of ground mustard. Alrighty, so I'm just gonna go ahead and pour these in the bowl and mix everything up. And then all we need to do is wait for the ham to warm up and then we'll put the glaze on. Now I just wanted to add, as you've probably heard me say in the past, you know, waste not, want not. I do not throw out these jelly jars. What I do is, I, there is a little bit of jelly left in there, in this case marmalade, and in that one a ginger preserves. And when I get ready to make a salad dressing or a, or a marinade, uh, whatever the case may be along those lines, I add my oil and my vinegar, my seasonings, my salt and pepper, whatever, to this jar, shake it up, and then I have a nice salad dressing or a, or a marinade that has a little bit of sweetness left over from what was in these jars. So I'll just go ahead and refrigerate those just as they are, and then they're waiting for me when I'm ready. Alrighty, so I've got the marmalade and the ginger preserves in here, and now I'm gonna go ahead and add all our spices in, one, two, three, and then I'm just gonna mix this up. Oh, it smell, I can really smell the ginger. It's just wonderful. I love ginger. I love the ginger candy, the, the crystallized ginger. I love the uh, ginger preserves. If you've never had these, definitely try them if you can find them at your grocery store. Oh, they're just wonderful on toast. Alrighty, well, now, what you can do at this point is add a little, maybe about a half a cup of brown sugar or you can use, like I often use the sucanat or the rapidura, you know, the dried cane juice. And that adds an additional layer of sweetness if you want to make the ham sort of real sweet and sticky. I'm not going to do that because it can, I've done it in the past and it, some people really like it because it's just really sweet and sticky. Um, but I don't know, as we all get older, I think we like to have a little less sugar and we've got a lot in the jam already. So I'm not gonna go ahead and add that in this time. But, so that's optional if you wanna add another layer of sweetness to it. And the other thing I wanna mention is if you can't find or, or you don't want to buy a pre-cooked ham that's spiral sliced, you can still do the same thing, the same glaze with a fresh ham. And you can buy the fresh ham bone in or you could buy the fresh ham with the bone removed and then you can even stuff the pocket uh, of the ham, which is very nice. You could do like a little cornbread dressing or something like that. But if you do buy a fresh ham, then, I mean, depending on the, the weight of it and whatnot, but you know, an average sort of bone-in fresh ham, uh, you'd probably cook, on, you know, you could boil it on your stove for about three and a half hours or so and then remove it from the pot and then wrap it, you know, in foil you know, like a little surround uh, or, you know, um, on the baking sheet, you know, put some foil down and then maybe a little surround too to kind of make a, like a little reservoir and put your glaze on and then pop it in your oven for 25, you know, for, you know, you're gonna have to watch it. Everybody's oven's different. But uh, you wanna put it at 425 for, you know, maybe 15, 20 minutes, you just kinda gotta watch it. But so, I just wanted to let you know you can do this with a fresh ham too. Well, I just took the ham out of the oven. It, it warmed in there for about an hour and it just smells wonderful. The hickory uh, smoking flavor that's coming out of it is just delightful. And so now what I'm gonna do is put the glaze on and then we'll put it back in the oven for about 10, 15 minutes here. It's one of those things you really have to watch and it'll be at 425 because we don't want it to burn. And but I'm just gonna get this glaze on. I'm gonna smooth it on uh, with a spoon and then I'm gonna use my pastry brush also to just kind of brush it into every nook and cranny. This is just gonna be wonderful. And then I'm, I'm really looking forward to enjoying this because I'm also letting some uh, uh, bread dough rise. I'm going to make rolls and how delicious it'll be to make a little ham sandwiches. I love doing that. This is uh, just a glorious uh, Christmas Day dinner. This is usually what I do on Christmas Day. I'll do this and a turkey so people have, you know, choice. But uh, I have to confess, I, I think the ham is usually more popular than the turkey. <laughs> So what I like to do with the pastry brush is get in between these spiral slices. I use the spoon to kind of separate them a bit. And then I get in with the pastry brush just to try to 
sneak some of the glaze down a little deeper into each slice of ham. Well, I'm just rolling up the foil a little around this just to make a little, little well to hold in all of the glaze because after it uh, browns a little in the oven, uh, any glaze that drips down, I'll put that in a little bowl and serve that on the side if people want to put extra uh, glaze on their own individual slices. And I have to tell you, when this glaze hit the hot ham, the smell of cloves and cinnamon and ginger is it's almost intoxicating. It smells so good. Alrighty, I'm going to go ahead and get this in my oven, 425. I'm going to watch it, you know, 10, 15 minutes maybe, and uh, then we'll be ready to eat. Well, it took just about 15 minutes at 425, and it's just all bubbly and, and glorious. I hope I'm going to move this little so you can just see all the way around how beautiful that glaze looks. And then in the front piece here, just scrumptious. Alrighty, well now we have to have the taste test. So let me just take a little slice off of this, and we'll see how it came. I'm just going to scoop out. I got a little piece. I don't think anybody will miss it. And uh, I'm scooping off a little bit of this uh, glaze to put on top of the, the, the ham. Just a little extra bit. Let's give this a taste and see how it came. Mmm. This is so good. I've made this before, so I knew it was going to be good, <laughs> but it really is good. I usually only make this once a year at Christmas, so a little bit of me forgets exactly how delicious it is. Now I know why I make this every Christmas, <laughs> and I hope that you'll make it too. It's really good. This holiday season, give the gift of stories and recipes with my new book, The Modern Pioneer Cookbook, available everywhere books are sold. Today I want to share with you the best Rock Hornish game hen recipe with a delicious raspberry sauce. Well, before we go over the ingredients, I have to tell you a cute story as to where this recipe came from. This was a recipe that was provided to us by my college roommate's mother. And she told her daughter, my roommate, if there's a fella at college that you like, invite him over for dinner and make these Rock Cornish game hens. And I'm confident he's gonna ask you out on a date and maybe even date you more than one date. Well, she found a fella she liked, she made these Rock Cornish hens, he asked her out on a date, and they dated their whole senior year. So I think these Rock Cornish hens are the way to a man's heart. And the nice thing about making Rock Cornish hens, not just for a fella you might be interested in, but this is a wonderful meal to make whenever you're having family or friends over for dinner. You can certainly make this at any time, but it's especially nice at holiday time. There's really very little preparation, and once you get in the oven, the oven does all the work for you. So you can enjoy your family and friends, and you don't have to worry about trying to prepare a lot of different things in the kitchen. Now I'm just going to make four Rock Cornish hens, but you can easily double this and make eight. And I'm going to keep them whole because I really think that looks so wonderful when you bring it to the table. Everyone sort of gets their own little, in a way, something that looks like a little mini turkey. But if you want to stretch this, you can easily cut these in half and serve everyone a half a Rock Cornish hen. And then you can just add some extra sides. Now the first thing that you're going to want to do is preheat your oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Then what I've got here are my four Rock Cornish hens, and I've defrosted these and patted them dry. Now the other ingredients you're going to need are a tablespoon of salt, a teaspoon of black pepper, and optionally, if you like to add in a little spice, a half to a teaspoon of red pepper flakes. Now I've got my salt and my two peppers just mixed in a little container here because I'm going to be working this into my hens and I don't want to be touching my salt and pepper shakers. Next, you're going to need four tablespoons of melted butter. Now I'm going to stuff these hens and I'm going to stuff them with a wild rice mixture. You can certainly leave them unstuffed or you could stuff them with a bread mixture that you may like. But the nice thing about stuffing them is it looks very nice having the stuffing sort of flowing out of the cavity. It looks very abundant. 
Plus, that serves as a side dish that you really don't have to do very much work with. Now, I'm going to be using a wild rice blend, which I find holds up very well as a stuffing in these hens. And what I do is I do cook it, but to the point where it almost is still a little bit al dente, meaning that it has like a little bit of a bite still to it, since it'll be cooking additional time inside the hens. I find that this particular wild rice blend works very well. This is from Lundberg and it's just called wild blend rice. But the reason I like it is it's a very nutritious mixture. It's got long grain brown rice, sweet brown rice, which gives it a little bit of a sticky consistency, which works very well when stuffing it into the hens, as well as being, uh, it's very complimentary with the raspberry sauce. And then it also has the wild rice, the red rice, which gives it like a, a little bit of a, almost a cranberry hue to it, which again works very nicely with the raspberry sauce. And then finally, it has some black rice, which is supposed to be kind of a rare rice. And so this is especially nice for special occasions. Now the other ingredient, almost the star of the show in a sense, even though the hens are, are the main, main event, but what makes this recipe so luscious is that you are going to coat your hens with raspberry jelly or raspberry jam. The ideal thing is if you can find raspberry jelly. I'm not able to find that at my grocery store, but maybe you'll be able to, or maybe you even make it homemade. So instead, what I'm going to be using is a red raspberry jam. And I wasn't even able to find this without seeds. That would have been ideal. But since it does have seeds, once we warm it up, I'm just going to run it through a fine mesh strainer to get rid of the seeds. Now, can you use other jellies or jams? Definitely. But there's something about this red raspberry that just makes for a beautiful color and a beautiful flavor. But I have used other jams when I've made this. I've used uh, apricot, I've used peach, I've used apple jelly. Apple jelly is nice because it's very easy to do and you don't have to worry about uh, any seeds or, you know, it's an actual jelly. Uh, which is always your first choice if you can find a jelly. But you can really vary this up in any way that you want. But I highly recommend you try it with some raspberry jelly or raspberry jam first. Now, I like to do this on a rimmed baking sheet. Some of you may know it as a jelly roll pan uh, or a half sheet cake pan. This works very well. And I highly recommend, I don't use a lot of aluminum foil, but I highly recommend that you, if you do this in a baking sheet, that you uh, put some aluminum foil on it or some parchment paper because the jelly or the jam, whatever you're using, does make things very sticky and a little hard to clean. So being able to make cleanup easy is a plus. Now you can also do this in a roasting pan as well. My roasting pan doesn't have a flat rack and this flat rack doesn't fit into my roasting pan. So that's another reason why I'm using the uh, baking sheet. Now, if you've just got the baking sheet, you can put your hens right down onto your foil or your parchment paper, whatever you've lined your baking sheet with. But I do have this cooling rack that fits perfectly into my baking sheet. So I'm gonna actually put my hens onto that. Lifting them up a little does help them brown a little better on their underside rather than sitting flat on the baking sheet. Uh, but if you don't have a rack like this, don't worry. Uh, you could always slice up a little bit of carrot or celery and almost make like a little bit of a, a homemade uh, roasting rack to kind of help lift your hens right off of the off of being directly on the baking sheet. Now the first thing I'm going to do is just take a little bit of this butter and I'm just going to brush it onto my uh, baking rack here or my cooling rack actually uh, just so that nothing sticks. Now I'm just going to set up a little assembly line here and what I'm going to do is take one hen at a time and I'm going to take a little bit of my seasoning here with just the salt and the black pepper and the red pepper flakes and then I'm going to just rub that into the cavity. Once I get all of that seasoning in there and massaged around into the cavity a little bit, then what I'm going to do is take my wild rice. I've divided it into four sections, basically, just a rough measure here. And I'm going to start putting this into the cavity of my hen. 
and I'm really going to pack it nicely. Now once you get the wild rice stuffed in there, you can just go ahead and put this on your baking sheet. And then what I like to do is take the little wing tips and just tuck them under the breast. Now the reason I like to tuck the wing tips underneath the breast is that if they're just sort of sticking up, they tend to burn. So this way you're protecting them. Now, you could certainly tie the little legs together if you wanted, but because we do have them stuffed with the wild rice, I think it's best to just leave the little legs untied and just have the wild rice showing coming out of the cavity. Well, I'll go ahead and continue stuffing the rest of these hens, and then I'll show you the next step. Well, I've got each of these hens all stuffed now, and they look wonderful. And I'm gonna take our melted butter and our brush here, this is a silicone brush, it works very nicely, but if you have a regular pastry brush, that'll work fine too. Just when you get to the point where you use the raspberry jelly, which I'll show you once we get these hens cooking, uh, the pastry brush can be a little more difficult to clean, but the silicone brush is very easy to clean. Well, the hens are all brushed with the melted butter, and now I'm gonna use the rest of the salt and pepper mixture, and I'm just gonna go ahead and sprinkle this on top of all the hens. Well, I gave my hands a good washing, and now we're ready to get these into the oven. Now, every rock Cornish hen is slightly different in size, but they generally take somewhere between an hour to an hour and 15 minutes to roast, at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, if you want, at about 30 minutes, you can take a peek at them and you can baste them with some of the butter that may have melted off. And at the 60 minute mark, the one hour mark, you're going to want to test them by putting a thermometer, a, one of those quick read thermometers that you use to insert into cooked meats, to make sure that your hens have reached 180 degrees Fahrenheit. And you're just gonna to wanna to stick your meat thermometer into the thigh of the hen. And when it's at 180 degrees Fahrenheit, your hens are done. And once they're done, that's when we're going to baste them with our raspberry sauce. And just let them be under the broiler, watched very closely for about a minute. And that raspberry sauce for that little bit of time under the broiler is going to turn these into something that's so lusciously sweet, sticky, and very delicious. Well, I'll get these into the oven and we'll make our raspberry sauce. Now, if you have raspberry jelly, this process is extremely easy for you. All you're gonna need to do is just get a small saucepan, put your raspberry jelly in there, and just warm it up to the point where it's somewhat liquidy. And the same is true if you're using raspberry jam. Just warm it until it's somewhat in a liquidy state. Now, since I have raspberry jam that has seeds in it, I'm just gonna have to take that extra step and uh, run it through a little bit of a mesh strainer to get the seeds out. Well, I warmed up my jam to the point where it's nice and liquidy, and now I'm just gonna pour it through this very fine mesh strainer, and we'll get all those seeds out. Now I'm just gonna use my spatula to work my jam down through this mesh strainer and collect it into my measuring cup and that'll leave the seeds behind. Now I just wanna mention that the jam that I used was from a 12 ounce jar. This is not an exact science. If you have an eight ounce jar or a 16 ounce jar, it'll be fine, you're gonna have plenty. Now I'm just gonna pour my seedless raspberry jam back into my little pan here so that we'll keep it warm for when we're ready to baste the raw Cornish hens with it. Well, I just took these hens out of the oven and they look glorious. You could just serve them like this if you wanted. Now, mine took just about an hour and 15 minutes to reach the 180 degrees Fahrenheit in the thigh when I checked it with my thermometer. And all I use is this simple little meat thermometer. It's not an instant read. If you have one of those, that's even better. But this worked great. Now, don't worry if what happens, if what happened to me happens to you. <laughs> If the rice or whatever stuffing you're using falls out, it's not a problem. When we go to plate it, 
we'll fix it up and it'll actually look really nice. It'll look very abundant, you know, that there's a lot of filling coming out from the cavity. Well, I've got my warmed jam here. And I just want to mention, you may be wondering why I prefaced at the very beginning of this recipe to try and find jelly if you can. And the reason is when you put the jelly on your rock Cornish hens and then put them under the broiler, it creates a visual effect that almost looks like stained glass. It's very pretty. Now, the jam still looks very nice too, and when it comes to flavor, it's basically the same. And the bottom line is it's all about flavor. Now, if you have a pastry brush or this silicone type brush, this works great for this job. But if not, don't worry, you can do this with a spoon as well. You can just spoon some of your jam right on top and then just swizzle it around with the back of your spoon. Okay, I'm just going to scoop some onto each of these hens and then we'll use our pastry brush to get this into every little nook and cranny. Now, I don't want you to worry if you don't have a thermometer like this. I just wanted to mention that you can definitely test to see that these are done the old fashioned way. You can give the leg a little shake, make a little incision. If the juices run clear, your hens are done. And since we are covering them with the jam or the jelly, whatever you have, you can easily cover up the incision with a little bit of the, ja the jam. So that'll work fine for you. Now I'm going to go ahead and put these under the broiler. You only need to do this for about a minute. This is the only time you really need to babysit this recipe. You don't want to walk away from the broiler because a broiler can really burn things very quickly. All you're looking for is for the jam. It'll start to get a little bubbly and begin to sort of melt a little and you'll know that you're all set to remove your hens. Well, these look absolutely glorious. Let's plate them up and take a taste. Well, I plated this up on a platter to give you a serving suggestion idea. I'm serving this with green beans amandine. They're very easy to make, yet they seem festive. You just get the thin green string beans. Sometimes they're called haricover or French green beans. And I just put them in a frying pan with some butter and some sliced almonds, toss them around for a few minutes, and you're done. And I just think that they look so lovely with the rock Cornish hens. Now, what I want to do is just take, I think what I'm going to do is take the, one of the little legs off and we'll give this a taste. And I'll also show you up close how this looks. Oh my goodness, it's so tender. I think that your family, your friends, here's yourself, you're going to really enjoy this. I also cut into the breast so that you could see how beautiful it is. And moist, tender, oh, it's just glorious. Well, let's give this little leg a taste with the skin on it. I think it's going to really be good. Mmm, mmm. Oh my goodness, it's so tender. When I went to take a bite into this, the entire piece of meat wanted to come off the bone. That's how tender it is. And the raspberry jam is just wonderful. It's got a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of tang. You're gonna really love this. Today I want to share with you the best roast duck recipe and I'm going to share lots of tips and tricks for how to cook a duck so that it comes out perfect every time. Now the first thing I want to say is that I don't want you to worry if you've never roasted a duck before. It's very easy to do and I'm going to walk you through the whole process step by step. And the nice thing about roasting a duck is that it makes a lovely presentation when you bring it to the table, especially for a celebratory or a holiday meal. Now we're going to go over all the ingredients that you're going to need to cook your duck. The first thing you're going to need is a duck. That's the star of the show. And ducks generally are sold between five to six pounds. My duck that I have here is a little over five pounds. For this particular recipe, I'm going to give the duck a bit of an orange flavor. So for the sauce, what you're going to want is a half a cup of orange juice and a jar of some type of jam or jelly. If you can find currant jelly or apple jelly, those work beautifully. 
What I've got here, though, is some orange marmalade, and I thought this would go perfect with the orange juice. But I'm actually going to strain out the actual pieces of marmalade, the, of the orange rind that's in the marmalade, because I wouldn't want those to burn on top of my duck. But I wanted to give you an option of using orange marmalade in the event that you can't find currant jelly or apple jelly, which I'm not able to find at my grocery store. And if you can't find marmalade or any of the other jellies that I mentioned, you can also use jam. A peach jam will work well, as well as an apricot jam. And if you like to add a lot of spice to the coating that you're going to put on your duck, you can certainly use some of the hot pepper jellies that are available at most grocery stores. And the next few ingredients that you're gonna need are just a little mixture of salt and pepper. I've got uh, some black pepper and also some red pepper flakes in here, but really you can just use salt if you want or just salt and pepper. I always like to add a little bit of spice with the red pepper flakes. And we're going to use this inside the cavity of the duck. Also into the cavity of the duck, I'm gonna add one whole bulb of garlic. And in addition for the cavity, I'm also gonna add some citrus. Now what I've got here are the little mandarin oranges. Sometimes you might see them at the grocery store called cuties. Uh, you can also just use regular oranges as well. But the reason I have a bit of an orange theme going on here is because orange works very well with duck. And what I've got here is some salt and some paprika. And we're going to use that as a rub on the outside of the duck. And this is just the regular paprika. You could also use the smoked paprika if you like that flavor. But the reason that I like to use paprika is it really helps give a nice color to the skin. It makes it look very appetizing, makes for a wonderful presentation. Now, if you buy your duck at the grocery store and it's wrapped in packaging, when you get it home and you take it out of its packaging, you might notice that it has a bit of scoring down the middle. Duck has a lot of fat underneath its skin, and this scoring helps that fat to render easily. But whether your duck comes with this little bit of scoring down the middle or it doesn't, it doesn't matter, because I'm gonna show you what we're gonna do to make the fat render very easily. Now, one option to help the fat render easily is to make cross hatches across the duck, across the top of the duck. However, I don't like doing that because I find that the presentation doesn't look very nice after it's been cooked. Also, if you're new to cooking duck, you need to be very careful when you make those cross hatches. You need to make sure that your knife is very sharp and you need to be very careful that you're just cross hatching the skin and that you're not cutting into the meat. Because if you cut into the meat, you can cause it to become dry during the cooking process. And I know that might seem a little odd if there's so much fat under the skin, but the fat tends to render out rather than into the meat. Instead, what I like to do is to take a sharp fork like this that has very pointed tines, and then all I like to do is poke the duck, this, just in the skin very gently, all over the top, the legs, and also on the underside as well. And if you don't have a fork like this that has these very sharp tines, you can then use maybe like a little skewer or something along the lines that's just going to make a small piercing in the skin. And it's all those little poke marks that are going to allow the fat to render out, yet still give your duck a lovely presentation. So the first thing we're gonna do is to take our fork or our skewer, whatever you're using, and we're just gonna very gently just start piercing the skin. And the safest way to do this to prevent also piercing the meat is to kind of go on the diagonal. So you're just gonna kind of go gently in like this. Now as you go ahead and start piercing the skin and you're gonna be doing it on the diagonal, you're going to find that it does take a little bit of a force that you do need to use to break through that skin. However, don't be afraid because especially since you're doing it on the diagonal, instead of trying to go like this, the chances of you piercing the meat is very rare. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and finish piercing all of this skin and then we'll go on to the next step. Now, as you're piercing the skin, you're going to put the piercings about 
an inch or so apart as you work your way across the skin. Now at this point, certain recipes will tell you to go ahead and submerge your duck in boiling water for a few minutes to help start rendering out the fat. I don't like to do that because I feel that you lose out on some of the wonderful duck fat that's going to render down into your roasting pan, which you're going to save to use to cook with. And there's nothing like potatoes sautéed in duck fat. Now certainly you can do that if you wish, and then after you remove the duck, rather than just discarding the water, you could let it cool and then skim any fat that has been rendered into that boiling water. You can skim that fat off the top and then save that for your cooking. But I really don't recommend that process because it's an extra step of added work and I don't think it makes a significant difference in the overall cooking time of your duck. Now at this point, what you want to do is go ahead and preheat your oven to 425 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we're not going to roast our duck at 425 degrees Fahrenheit. We're actually going to turn our oven down to 350 degrees Fahrenheit when we go ahead and put it in the oven. But getting the oven nice and hot for that initial blast of heat for your duck is very helpful to get the fat to begin to render. However, you want to be rendering it overall and cooking your duck overall at a lower temperature and so that's why we turn it down to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Now if when you unwrapped your duck it came with some giblets in the cavity you want to make sure those are removed but definitely save those because we'll take the carcass of our duck and we can use it to make duck bone broth. And so I've got the neck here and I believe, I'm not sure if this is the gizzard, it looks like yeah, I think it's the gizzard or the heart, I'm not sure. And then I've got the liver here. Now, the liver we won't use in the bone broth making process. The liver would make our bone broth cloudy. However, you want to save that liver, cook it up, and eat it as a little cook's treat because it's very nutritious. Now, when you're roasting a duck, the best thing to use is a roasting pan that has a roasting rack. And any type of roasting rack will work. Mine is the type that's sort of bent like this, but if you have a flat roasting rack, that's fine too. But the bottom line is we want to lift the duck off of the roasting pan or off of whatever, maybe you're doing it on a sheet pan if you don't have an actual roasting pan. Uh, a baking sheet pan. You want to keep the duck above the fat that's going to render out from it because we want the skin to be very crisp all over. So a roasting pan with any type of rack or a baking sheet with a rack will work perfectly. Now some recipes from various chefs will tell you to go ahead and just cut away this extra skin that's here. I really don't find it necessary and personally I think that the fat will render out beautifully from it and you'll just have more crispy duck skin and I think you can never have enough crispy duck skin. Now I've cut my garlic bulb in half. That's all you can do. You leave the skin on very easy. And I've just cut up about three, I think, yeah, I cut three cuties uh, into quarters. And I'm basically just going to see how many I can fit in. I can always add more later. Now the first thing I'm going to do is take my salt and pepper mixture here and I'm going to give the cavity a really good rubbing. Now certainly if doing something like this uh, is a little difficult for you, I know some people are very uncomfortable touching raw poultry, you can certainly use disposable gloves. Now I'm going to go ahead and take my garlic, half of my garlic bulb, and put that into the cavity. And then I'm just going to start putting in my mandarins. I was actually able to get all six of my little mandarin oranges in there. And now we're just going to finish off with putting the garlic clove in last. So we've got a garlic clove, or not a clove, a half a garlic bulb at both the front and the back. The next thing that we're going to do is take our salt and paprika mix. I'm going to mix this together and then we're going to go ahead and we're going to rub this all over the duck, with the exterior part of the duck, all over the skin. And it's very easy. It's not an exact science. Just go ahead and start rubbing this in and we'll, once we get the top done, we'll turn it over and we'll do the bottom. Now we're going to roast our duck 
at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Now my duck is a little over five pounds. It's about five pounds and a quarter. So this is going to take about three hours to three hours and 15 minutes to roast thoroughly. If your duck is closer to six pounds, then you're going to roast it for about three hours and 15 minutes to three hours and 30 minutes. And what we're looking for is for this duck to reach an internal temperature of 180 degrees Fahrenheit. And you'll take a thermometer, a meat thermometer, and you'll insert it into the area around the thigh and the leg without being near the bone. And once it regist registers 180 degrees Fahrenheit, your duck will be cooked. And if you don't have a meat thermometer, don't worry. You can always test your duck by giving the leg a little shake, seeing if it should feel very loose. And you can always make a little incision and see if the juices run clear. And yes, I am cooking my duck to an internal temperature of 180 degrees Fahrenheit. I know many recipes will call for an internal temperature of 145 degrees Fahrenheit, but I really like a duck to be well cooked. I do not like the breast meat to have a rare appearance, although I know some people do like that. So there are options to you, but I highly recommend to avoid any pink or rubbery meat that you cook your duck to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Now I'm very gingerly going to pick this up and put this down into my roasting pan, breast side down. And you'll notice that I have the wing tips tucked down and under the bottom side of the duck. And it's going to work fine because tucked in like this, they do rest very flat. So you don't have to worry about the wing tips burning, whether, they're, uh, whether you have the duck uh, breast side down or breast side up. They're very flat and they're nicely tight in <laughs> in the underside of the duck. Now, while our duck is roasting, we'll get ready to make our glaze. But before we do that, I just want to take a few minutes to talk about a few things that you want to do during the duck roasting process. Now, as you saw, when we put the duck into the oven, we put it in breast side down, and that really helps the fat render relatively quickly. Then after one hour of roasting, you want to turn your duck right side up. And the easiest way that I've found to do that when I'm working with hot poultry is to basically use two wooden spoons, one into the neck, one into the cavity, and then just work your way uh, turning it right side up. And I recommend doing that by taking your roasting pan out of the oven and putting it on a heat proof surface. So you're not trying to turn the duck while it's also in the oven. And while you have the duck out of the oven, that's a good time to start siphoning off some of the fat that's beginning to render. And the way I like to do this is simply by using a baster, siphoning out some of the fat and then putting it into a bowl and then just doing that until I get the bulk of the fat that's been rendered into my bowl. Now you could also do this into a glass measuring cup, but I had the bowl handy, so that's why I put it into the bowl. Next, what I do is take a little strainer and I put it over a jar, and then I simply pour the fat through the strainer and let it go down into my jar. And the reason that I do that is because from roasting the bird, there may be some little bits and bobs of debris that you don't necessarily want in your rendered fat. So this strainer collects them, and then I've got some beautiful duck fat here. Then at the two hour mark, you're going to take your roasting pan out of the oven again, place it on a heat proof surface, siphon out any duck fat that's in the bottom of your roasting pan, go through the same process of filtering it and putting it into your storage container. And at that point, you can decide if you want to rotate your duck again. If at that one hour mark, when you put the duck breast side up, you felt that the bottom of your duck had browned very nicely and didn't necessarily need to be rotated, you can allow the duck to cook right side up for the remaining time. And if at any time you feel your duck is over browning, 
but it's not quite ready. It hasn't reached that 180 degrees Fahrenheit internal temperature. You can always tent it with a little bit of aluminum foil. That'll keep the skin from overbrowning, but it will allow the duck to continue cooking. As you're rotating your duck and you've started with breast side down and then you've gone to breast side up and then maybe you've gone to breast side down again, what you want to do in the last 15 or 30 minutes of cooking time, you do want to rotate your duck again so that you are ending with the duck breast side up. Now we'll get ready to make the glaze or the sauce, whichever you want to call it. And it's very easy to do. We're basically going to warm our jam or jelly along with our orange juice. But because I have orange marmalade and I don't want the peel to be part of this glaze, I'm going to warm my orange marmalade first and then put it through a mesh strainer to collect all of the citrus rind. What I have here is a 16 ounce jar of marmalade. But don't worry if you have a 12 ounce jar or an eight ounce jar of whatever jam or jelly you're using. This is not an exact science. So if you have some extra glaze left over after you've glazed your duck, then you can serve that as a sauce on the side at the dinner table. Well, I've warmed my marmalade here and I'm just gonna pour this through this mesh strainer so that I can collect all that rind. Well, I got most of the jam part out of the marmalade. I'm left with a little bit of the rind here, and I'm just gonna go ahead and decant this back into my jam jar, and I can mix that with some other marmalade, make it really rich with rind. Now I'm just gonna pour my marmalade back into my pot here. Now, if you're using a jam in your, or jelly that has no rind in it, no seeds, nothing like that, then you can skip this step. Next, we're just gonna go ahead and add in our half a cup of orange juice. Now we'll just give that a good stir to incorporate the juice and the marmalade, and we'll go ahead and rewarm that on the stovetop. Well, I just took this duck out of the oven and it looks glorious. And it's cooked to perfection to 180 degrees Fahrenheit internal temperature. Now I've got my glaze here that I've warmed up the orange juice and the marmalade mixed together. And if you've got a silicone pastry brush or a traditional pastry, pastry brush, either one will work. Or if you don't have either of those, you can just use a spoon. I've got a large spoon here. And you just wanna start spooning this glaze over your duck. And then if you've got the pastry brush, you can just work at painting it into every nook and cranny. Once you feel that your duck is sufficiently covered with the glaze, we're gonna go ahead and put this back under the broiler. And don't feel you need to use all of your glaze. As you see, I still have quite a bit left that I'm gonna to bring to the dinner table. But when we put this under the broiler, this is going to get beautifully bubbly and crisp. Now, when it comes to working with the broiler, you need to be very careful. This literally will take maybe a minute or two. So this is the time when you really want to babysit this and not walk away from it. Alrighty, let's go ahead and put it under the broiler. Well, I literally had this under the broiler for no more than two minutes, and it just looks beautiful. It looks so delicious. I can't wait for us to give it a taste. But I want to show you how beautifully browned on top it is, glistening thanks to that glaze. And if you notice, the underneath of the duck is also very well cooked and the skin is beautifully browned and that's from us rotating it. Now I'm going to show you how I like to garnish this before I serve it at the table. Well, how I like to garnish this is with some Brussels sprouts and toasted pecans and a handful of pomegranates. And all I do is cut the Brussels sprouts in half, boil them uh, for about five minutes, then toss them into a pan, a frying pan, in which I've put some butter and I've toasted the pecans a little bit. Then I toss everything up together and then throw in a few fresh pomegranates at the last minute just to warm them through a bit and then circle them around the duck. I love it because it looks like a little bit of a Christmas wreath. This can really make a wonderful Christmas dinner. Now, I also sliced a few more fresh mandarin oranges because I was thinking that I might put those on top of the cavity, 
But to be honest with you, looking at this up close, I think that the roasted mandarin oranges look so lovely that there's no need to cover them up with fresh mandarins. I guess you could also tuck in a few around the duck, but I think it's just perfect the way it is. Well, this is just so pretty, I almost hate to cut into it, but I want to show you uh, how the meat looks inside. Well, I want to show you how beautifully the fat has rendered underneath the skin. You have very little fat remaining and you just have this beautiful skin left. And the duck is so tender, literally falling off the bone. Well, let's give this a taste with the skin attached. Mmm. Mmm. Oh, that's delicious. Mm. It's so tender and the sweetness from the glaze on the skin is just glorious. Mm. Today I want to share with you an easy roast goose recipe with a port wine cherry sauce. Now, if you've never roasted a goose before, don't worry. This is relatively easy to do, and it makes a wonderful presentation for any type of celebratory meal, but especially nice for a Christmas dinner. And today we're gonna be like Mrs. Cratchit and create a Charles Dickens Christmas Carol dinner by roasting this stuffed with a sage and onion stuffing. Now the first ingredient that you're going to need is your goose. And the goose that I have here is about nine and a half pounds. And geese at the grocery store may come somewhere between eight pounds to as maybe as large as 16 pounds. But generally the average size is somewhere between eight and 12 pounds. Now this goose that's nine and a half pounds can probably serve about six people. Now as to price, a goose is going to be less expensive than something like a big beef standing rib roast. But of your more specialty poultries, goose is going to be a little more expensive than duck or rock cornish hens. And in a previous video, I showed you how to roast rock cornish hens, and I also showed you how to roast a duck, both of which also make wonderful dinners for various celebrations or especially Christmas dinner. And I'll be sure to link to those videos in the description below as well as the iCards. Now, if you've purchased your goose frozen, you'll want to give it at least a day or two to defrost in your refrigerator before you get ready to cook it. And once you've let your goose defrost, then you can remove the wrapper. And once you remove the wrapper, you're going to want to remove the giblets from the cavity of your goose. And you're most likely going to have a neck, a heart, a gizzard, and a liver. Now I'm going to set the neck aside because I'm going to use that when I make bone broth with the carcass of the goose. And for the heart and the gizzard, I'm going to chop that up, quickly saute it, and use that in our stuffing. And for the liver, I'm going to saute that up with a little butter and then just turn that into a little bit of goose liver pate that we can enjoy on some toast points. Goose liver is really a delicacy and not something that's always easy to find and it can also be rather on the pricey side. So we'll just sort of have a little mini goose liver pate with that. Now there is a little bit of preparation that goes into preparing our goose before we're ready to stuff it and roast it. And what I recommend is cutting off these very bony wing tips here. What I like to do is use my heavy duty kitchen shears and just cut off these wing tips and then I'll set them aside with the goose neck and I'll use that along with the carcass when I make the bone broth. So I basically just find where the joint is and break it off there and then just go in with my scissors and finish off cutting off my wing tip. So after you remove the wing tips, next you're going to want to look at the area on the bottom side of the cavity. Now on the bottom side of this cavity, you're going to see flaps of skin. And when you pull those flaps of skin back, it's going to reveal a lot of fat. You've got a lot of goose fat in here. Now, if we were not stuffing this goose, you could cut away a lot of this flap area as well as all of the fat. 
But since we are going to stuff this goose, I'm going to save the flaps so that I can cover up some of the stuffing. And by covering it up, I really help keep it in the goose. However, we don't need all of this extra fat. So what I'm going to do is cut this out and I'm going to put it in the bottom of my roasting pan and let it render with all of the other fat that we're going to let render out of this goose. Now next, if you want, you can leave on the tail and it can just serve as a little bit of a support for all of the stuffing that we're going to put into this goose. Or if you prefer, just from a presentation standpoint, to remove it, you can do that as well. I'm going to go ahead and remove it. Now this is also going to go into my bowl with my scraps because I'm going to use this when I make the bone broth because the tail is very rich in collagen which once cooked becomes gelatin and that's what makes your bone broth very gelatinous. And the more gelatinous your bone broth the better because gelatin is very healing to our digestive tract. Next, you want to look at the top end of the cavity. And here you're going to see that you have a lot of skin. Now, since I will be stuffing the cavity, both the lower end and the upper end, I will still remove some of the skin because this is much more than we will need. But I am going to reserve a little bit just to cover that stuffing that I'll have here in the upper cavity part. But how much you want to keep or remove is totally up to you. If you want, you can cut away most of the skin here at the neck portion of the cavity, and then you can even go in there and remove the wishbone. But since I'm gonna be stuffing it, I'm not gonna worry about that. So I'm just gonna go ahead and remove some of this skin, just leaving a little bit of it down on the bottom. Now, with this extra skin that you trim off your goose, you have a couple of options. You, you can go ahead and just throw this into your scrap bowl and use this uh, when you make your bone broth, or you can go ahead and throw it into the bottom of your roasting pan and let some of this fat render off during the roasting process. We're gonna have plenty of fat rendering from this goose, so I'm gonna go ahead and use this piece for my, my bone broth. Now I do want to mention for those of you who are uncomfortable working with raw poultry, if you want to wear disposable gloves to do this whole process, you certainly can. Now I'm going to go give my hands a good wash and then we're going to move on to the next step. Now the next thing that you want to do is pierce the skin of your goose all over because this piercing is going to allow the fat to render out from your goose. Now, some people like to use a knife and make hatch hash marks. I don't like to do that, as I shared with you when I made the duck, uh, which that's also a common pro process to uh, make the hash marks. I find that it doesn't make for a, a very attractive presentation after the goose is cooked. So instead, what I like to do is take the tines of a very sharp fork, this is for a carving fork, or uh, a trussing needle can work very well, or a, a skewer that you may use for shish kebab. Any of those will work well. And then what you need to do is do this sort of on a 45 degree angle. You don't want to go in like this because we don't want to pierce the meat. Piercing the meat can cause it to dry out. And I know that seems funny because there's so much fat in a goose, but the fat really renders out. And if we pierce the meat, it can dry out. So take your fork, your skewer, whatever you're using, and just start going all over your goose just with maybe about an inch apart uh, each uh, insertion. And we're gonna go all over until we've poked this goose completely, both the top and the bottom, the wings, the legs, everything. Now that we've got our goose all prepped, we're gonna make the stuffing. Now in the book, A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, Mrs. Cratchit stuffs her goose with a sage and onion stuffing. And a sage and onion stuffing actually has a very long history in England. It was very popular with Queen Elizabeth I, which I believe she lived in the 1500s. 
and A Christmas Carol is set in Victorian England in the 1800s. Now what I've got here is about nine or ten cups of stale bread cubes. You can use any stale bread that you have. That'll be completely fine. Next you're going to need some sage seasoning and what I have here is basically dried sage. If you don't have dried sage and you have it maybe mixed in with a poultry seasoning, you can certainly use that as well. Something like Bell's poultry seasoning would work fine. I also had some dehydrated herbs, primarily sage, with a little bit of parsley, I think, a little bit of onion. I'm going to go ahead and add that as well. I thought it would really help with a flavor boost. And in addition to your breadcrumbs and your sage seasoning, you're also going to want four onions. And I have four yellow onions here, and they're pretty good size onions. Now we're just going to chop up these onions, a pretty small chop, like a dice almost. We don't want too large a piece of onion in our stuffing. Now, don't throw out your scraps. Your onion skins are loaded with nutrition, very similar to the actual onion itself. So be sure to put this in your bowl along with your scraps that you're going to use to make your goose bone broth. Now that we've got our onions all chopped up, we're going to go ahead and add this in with our stale bread cubes. Then I'm just going to mix this up real well to make sure I have the onions well distributed amongst the breadcrumbs or bread cubes. Then we're going to go ahead and add in all of our sage seasoning. And I'm going to do the same thing, just mixing everything up to get it well distributed amongst the onions and the bread cubes. Now in my little saucepan here, I have 12 tablespoons of melted butter. And to that, I chopped up the gizzard and I chopped up the heart from the goose and I put it into the melted butter just to start cooking it a little bit. And now we're just going to go ahead and pour all of this right on top of our bread cube mixture. Then I'm just going to do the same thing and distribute this butter and the giblets throughout our bread cube mixture. Boy, the sage smells wonderful. It's going to also smell wonderful once it's in the goose and roasting in the oven. Now we're going to need about three cups of liquid that we're going to go ahead and add to our bread cube mixture. And we'll just add a little bit at a time. And what I've got here actually is chicken bone broth. You can use just a simple chicken broth if you've got that. You can use turkey broth or turkey bone broth if you have any leftover or that you made with your leftover uh, turkey carcass from Thanksgiving. Uh, if you don't have either of those, don't worry. You can certainly just use water. Now I'm going to go ahead and add in more of our liquid. I think this is going to wind up taking all three cups, so I'm going to go ahead and just add it all in at once. And now I'm going to just mix this again. Now we'll just set aside our stuffing for a minute and give it a chance to absorb all that liquid we added. And now we're going to season the outside of our goose. Now what I've got here in my bowl is a little mixture of salt and pepper and other seasonings. I do have a full tablespoon of sea salt. It's a fine ground sea salt. You can use any fine ground salt you have. And you may be saying, wow, that's a lot of salt. The skin of the goose needs a lot of salt. You're going to be using more salt than you think you would need because that's going to play a role in helping pull out some of the moisture and make sure that the skin of your goose cooks up nice and crisp. Other ways to really ensure that your goose comes out with a nice crisp skin is to do a wet brine or a dry brine or you can simply defrost your goose and then put it on a platter and then put it into your refrigerator uncovered and let the skin dry out overnight. That is often recommended by chefs. And if you've ever seen a cooking show with Jacques Pepin, the famous French chef and cookbook author, that's how he prepares his goose. He lets it defrost and then he leaves it uncovered overnight in his refrigerator. But this way is also going to ensure that we're going to get a nice crisp skin and it's great if you didn't remember to brine it or leave it overnight in your refrigerator uncovered. 
So what I've got here, as I said, is the tablespoon of fine ground sea salt. I also have a teaspoon of Chinese five, five spice powder, work, which works very well on goose, especially if you're making this during the Christmas season, because it has some wonderful spices in it. It has cloves and cinnamon and fennel and star anise and so it's very delightful. It also has some Szechuan pepper in it but I'm also going to add about a quarter of a teaspoon of freshly ground black pepper just to add a little more spice. And then finally what I've got over here is a teaspoon of paprika. It's just the regular paprika. You could certainly use the smoked paprika if you like that, but this is just the regular plain paprika and it helps with a wonderful coloring of the skin as you're roasting it to make it look very appetizing when you bring it to the table. So I'm just gonna go ahead and just mix this up very gently with give it a good stir actually not too gently <laughs> and then we're going to go ahead and start rubbing this right into the skin of our goose so here we go we're just gonna just do like this nothing fancy ah oh, this smells so good it just smells like christmas time and you want to rub your goose all over including the underside now, I'm not going to rub the cavity with any of this seasoning mix because we do have our stuffing that's very well seasoned. However, I'm not going to wash my hands between rubbing the, the rub, the spice rub, into the ex uh, exterior of the goose uh, as I go to go ahead and stuff it. And some of the flavoring from the exterior will transfer to the stuffing, just kind of pulling all of the flavors together, yet not be overwhelming. I don't want anything to overwhelm the sage flavoring. Now, once this absorbs all the liquid, you'll be able to actually form this into, you know, little shapes of, uh, little ball shapes uh, very easily. And that makes it very easy to go ahead and stuff it into the cavity of your bird. And I'm just gonna start first here with the upper side, the side where the neck was. And the only reason that I form this into little ball shapes is it's just a little easier for me to get it into the smaller side of the cavity. And then once I'm happy with how much I have in there, then I'm just gonna kinda tuck this skin in to hold in my stuffing. Now I've just got the flaps pulled back on the bottom side of the cavity and I'm going to go ahead and just start stuffing that with our mixture. Now once you get your goose all stuffed then you can take these flaps and just cover up your stuffing. That'll help keep it inside. Now should you trust the closing that you've covered, use the goose skin to cover your stuffing with? I don't recommend it. I also don't recommend tying the legs. And the reason is, unlike a turkey or a chicken, the goose has so much fat, the easier you make it for the fat to render, the easier it is to cook the goose or roast the goose, and then you don't have to worry about overcooking the breast meat, which we'll talk about in a minute because basically you're using these flaps to just sort of hold your stuffing in while it's uncooked. As your goose roasts, this skin is going to roast as well, uh, clearly, and it'll start to pull back a little. Some of the stuffing will become exposed, but it'll all pretty much stay in place because it started out covered. Alrighty, well now how do we go about roasting this goose? First, what I like to do is preheat my oven to 425 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we're not gonna roast this goose at that high temperature, but I like to put my goose into a nice hot oven to get the rendering process started. And because once we open the oven and get the roasting pan and 
put our goose in there, the temperature lowers. And so this way, at least we're getting off to a relatively good start. But once we close that oven door, we're going to lower the temperature to 325 degrees Fahrenheit. Since there is a lot of fat in this goose, do we start roasting it similar to the way we roast a duck? Are we going to put this breast side down and then halfway through flip it back up to breast side up? That is certainly an option. And if it's not stuffed, I think that's a very easy thing to do. But since I stuffed this goose, I'm going to keep it or I'm going to cook it more in the same fashion I would cook a stuffed turkey. So I am going to start this breast up and I'm going to let it roast the entire time breast up. And since I like to cook this goose to an internal temperature of around 170 degrees Fahrenheit, it's going to be in that 325 degree Fahrenheit oven for a good while. Stuffed like this and being nine and a half pounds is probably going to take about three and a half hours to reach that satisfactory internal temperature of 170 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's going to give the fat in this goose plenty of time to render and plenty of time for the skin to brown beautifully. But by all means, if you like starting with it breast side down, you can certainly do that. Now let's talk about the internal temperature of what I like to do when roasting this goose. Now you may see chefs recommending that you can cook your goose to the point where the breast registers at 135 degrees Fahrenheit up to 145 degrees Fahrenheit. And that would be cooking the goose breast to a rare or medium rare consistency. I really don't like that. Also, at that point when the breast reaches that internal temperature in that range from 135 to 145, they'll recommend removing the goose from the oven, cutting out the breast, setting that aside to keep warm, and then putting the goose back into the oven to continue roasting till the thigh and the legs are at the proper temperature. And generally at that point in terms of the breast being 135 degrees to 145 degrees, the fat or at least the skin has not had a chance to crisp up very nicely. So at that point they'll recommend often sauteing skin, the breast skin side down in a saute pan and then bringing that to your platter along with the legs and the thigh so you're serving your goose already carved. I find that to be a lot of work and I'm also, as I mentioned earlier, not a fan of when the goose breast is rare or medium rare. Here in the United States, the U.S. Department of Agriculture recommends roasting a goose to an internal temperature of 165 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's using a meat thermometer that is inserted into the thigh of the goose away from the bone. I even find that a little rare for my tastes. So I am more comfortable roasting my goose, as I mentioned earlier, to 170 degree Fahrenheit internal temperature. And I have even been known to roast a goose to an internal temperature of 180 degrees Fahrenheit. But I wanted to give you all of these ranges of temperature, internal temperature, because everyone has different tastes as to what they like. And in our family, we like pretty much all our poultry well cooked. And at an internal temperature of 170 degrees Fahrenheit, I do not find that the breast meat is dry. And the cherry sauce that we're going to make to serve with it would definitely rectify any bit of dryness if there is any. But the bottom line is I feel that this is a very easy way to roast a goose and to roast it where it's going to be palatable to most people, especially if you're serving this at a celebratory meal or a holiday meal like Christmas, and maybe people have never had goose before. 
and may not be accustomed to eating game birds and not accustomed to eating game birds rare or medium rare. Having your goose well cooked and having a nice sauce to serve on the side, in my humble opinion, makes this very palatable to pretty much everybody or at least everybody who eats poultry. Now I'm gonna gingerly pick up our goose and put it right down into our roasting pan. So into our oven it goes. I'm gonna lower the heat to 325 degrees Fahrenheit and then every 30 minutes we're going to check on our goose and we're going to remove the rendered fat. And the way I recommend doing that is to re take your roasting pan out of the oven, put it on a heat proof surface and use some sort of baster or a large spoon to remove the fat and then transfer it to a container for storage. But we do want to remove that fat as it renders because we don't want it to burn. Now there are two things that I want to mention before we go ahead and put this into the oven is number one, if you have a small oven, I have a very small oven, so I'm going to put my roasting pan with the goose in it into or onto the lowest rack of my oven. I'm going to put it into the lower third. If you have a very large oven, it's not a problem, but I don't want the top to brown too quickly. And if by any chance you do find that no matter where you put your goose in the oven, depending what rack you put it on, that it does start to brown too quickly, you can always tent it with aluminum foil while it continues to roast until it's done. And then just remove the aluminum foil like the last five minutes or so. And the other thing that I want to mention about roasting a goose is that you do need to use a roasting pan and a rack. You want the goose lifted up off of the bottom of your roasting pan so that the fat can render and so that the goose is not sitting in the fat. And you do need a roasting pan as, a, as opposed to just a baking sheet because of the size of a goose as opposed to a duck which you can generally roast on a baking sheet with a rack but with a goose because it tends to be larger and is going to release more fat then what can happen is if you just have a baking sheet with a rack that it can uh, the, the fat can overwhelm in essence and flow over the rim of the baking sheet and you don't want to have to keep opening the oven more than every 30 minutes. So that is why I highly recommend using a roasting pan. Alrighty, now into the oven. Well, while the goose is roasting, I want to show you the amount of fat that I removed from the roasting pan just after 30 minutes. And the way that I like to remove the fat from the roasting pan is by bringing my roasting pan out of my oven, putting it on a heat proof surface, and then using a baster, you may know it as like a turkey baster, to simply siphon out the fat and then put it into my glass storage container. I may wind up needing more than one of these, but what I like to do is put a little strainer over my jar that I'm using to uh, store my goose fat because that helps collect some of the little bits and bobs that I may uh, suction up with my turkey baster. Now that does take a minute or two to do. You could certainly do it a faster way by lifting the rack with the goose on it out of your roasting pan and then simply pouring uh, the fat out of the roasting pan. The only thing is I find that not necessarily complicated, but I need to make sure I have plenty of heat proof areas to put the rack on and put the roasting pan on and to be extremely careful so that I'm never burning myself because the roasting pan is a little on the heavy side and to lift it for an extended period while I'm pouring the fat always seems a little precarious to me. But certainly if you're a little more maybe coordinated than me, definitely you can do it that way. But I find this turkey baster works like a charm. Now once I get all of my goose fat into my containers, one I will store in the refrigerator 
because I'll be using that on a regular basis. And the other I'll put in the freezer and then just take that out when I use this one up. And I have to say that if you've never had goose fat, and I would completely understand if you hadn't because it is getting harder to find goose fat. Duck fat is a little more common, but goose fat is difficult to find. But if you are blessed to roast a goose and then have your own rendered goose fat, you've got to fry up some potatoes in it. You have never had fried potatoes until they've been fried in goose fat. They're absolutely delicious. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Mrs. Cratchit in the Charles Dickens Christmas Carol book uh, serves her goose with the uh, sage and onion stuffing. And as the side, she serves mashed potatoes and applesauce. But what I'm going to do is serve some roasted potatoes that have been roasted in, you guessed it, goose fat. And if you want, you can do sort of like a cheat roasting uh, process where you simply put some goose fat in a large saute pan or a large frying pan and cut your potatoes in half, put them cut side down and let them cook like that and they'll become beautifully browned on the bottom and cooked through uh, in the middle. Alternatively, you could cut your potatoes in half and then you could put them in the bottom of your roasting pan underneath the rack that you have your goose sitting on and let them roast together in about the last hour of roasting time. And what I like to do, whether I'm roasting them in the pan or sort of cheat roasting them on top of the stovetop, I like to use red skinned potatoes basically for two reasons. Number one, they roast up very well, whether you put them in the roasting pan with your goose or you do a cheat roast on the stovetop. And secondly, because of the red skin, they look lovely when they're presented on a platter with the goose for a lovely holiday celebration like Christmas. I get a fairly good size red potato. I don't buy the tiny little ones, although you certainly could, and you would just wanna put them in closer to the finished time of your goose if you're gonna roast them in the oven with your goose. You may wanna put them in maybe about 30 minutes uh, before you're ready to take your goose out of the oven. But I really find this size, sort of like a, you know, maybe like a bay would be about the size of a baseball maybe, uh, works very well. And I just cut it right in half and put it uh, cut side down into the roasting pan or into my frying pan. Now, this works best if you have somewhat of an angled roasting pan like I do, uh, or not a roasting pan, an angled roasting rack like I do because this gives you plenty of room to put your potatoes underneath. If you have a roasting rack that fits closer to the bottom of your roasting pan, this may be a little more challenging to do. So that's why I always like to share with you that this is also very easy to do on the stovetop. Now I do want to mention something that's very important to be aware of when it comes to cooking a goose and the whole process of rendering the fat. You may see recipes that tell you to poke the goose all over the way we did and then submerge it into boiling water for maybe 10 minutes. This process helps to extract some of the goose fat and then in turn helps cut down on the roasting time. And not only does it cut down on the roasting time, it also reduces the amount of goose fat that will render down into your roasting pan. To a certain extent, this process could be very helpful if you have an exceptionally shallow roasting pan. However, it's not a process that I like to do. Number one, I find working with something that's almost 10 pounds, a 10 pound, mine was nine and a half pound goose, trying to submerge it into boiling water and then take it back out again. I just find the process a little, not just time consuming, but a little laborious and a little awkward. Also, I'm losing that wondrous goose fat. Now, can you cool all of that water down to, in, from the pot from which you submerged your goose? Definitely. Uh, but that's going to take some time to allow that much water to cool and then 
or are you going to just scoop off the fat the best you can maybe use the fat separator that I've shared with you that I like to use when I make bone broth uh, there are some different ways to kind of rescue that goose fat so that you don't lose it however again these are all time consuming and as I said somewhat what I consider somewhat laborious methods uh, so I find just put the goose into the roasting pan raw roast it and then just check every 30 minutes to start removing your goose fat now while the goose is roasting we'll get ready to make some of the port wine cherry sauce that is absolutely scrumptious now don't worry if you don't have port wine or if you don't want to use any alcohol in making this cherry sauce no problem you can substitute grape juice and you'll just want to use half the amount of grape juice and then half water we're going to use one cup of the port so you would use half a cup of grape juice and half a cup of water now you're not limited by grape juice if you wanted to use some apple juice or even maybe some cherry juice which would be very nice given that we're making a cherry sauce you could certainly do that but again you're just going to use half the amount of juice and then dilute it with half water and if you're not familiar with port what port is is it's called a fortified wine and fortified wines of any kind are basically wines that have had something added to them different types of grapes maybe sometimes different types of liquors whatever the case may be but the whole point of adding something to the wine is to slow down and eventually stop the fermentation process and when we stop the fermentation process we create something that is a bit sweeter with the natural sugars from the grapes than a traditional wine that has been fermented longer so fortified wines are very nice to have on hand to cook with because they often have a lovely flavor and because they've been fortified and the fermentation process has been stopped they're often sold with screw tops as opposed to a cork and so this really makes them a home cook's best friend because if you have wine and you uncork it and it's not all consumed say at a dinner party or something at one sitting and you put it back into your pantry and then maybe weeks later you say oh I think I'm going to use some of that maybe as the acid base for your bone broth or whatever the case may be and then you open it and you smell it and it smells almost like vinegar because it kept fermenting and it had been exposed to air which as we learned from when we make homemade vinegar the air contains something known as acetobacter which helps the process of wine to turn into vinegar I also like keeping fortified wines like this on hand because my husband and I don't drink but when I make a bone broth or a sauce like this I really like to use a fortified wine for bone broth you need some sort of acidic medium to help extract the nutrients out of the bones that then is what makes your bone broth very nutritious now can you use some vinegar certainly can you use some citrus juice certainly but I have found from experience and from taste that using some sort of fortified wine like a white vermouth if I'm used making a chicken bone broth or a red vermouth or a port or a marsala or madeira whatever the case may be when I'm making a um, beef bone broth that the flavor is much softer and for the most part because this is such a long cooking time involved when making bone broth you're more or less cooking off a lot of the alcohol but if you have any concerns about that at all or if you absolutely cannot have any alcohol in your diet you can as I mentioned use vinegar or uh, some citrus based juice or even often just taking an orange or a lemon or a lime whatever the case may be and squeezing that right into your bone broth that will work well also and again for making a sauce like this juice makes a wonderful substitution for the port now I tried to keep our goose relatively authentic by making a simple roast goose with the sage and onion stuffing like Mrs. Cratchit did in A Christmas Carol but I am 
what did they say, zhuzhing it up a little <laughs> with uh, the cherry sauce because this is Christmas, this is holiday time and I think it just really makes for a lovely flavor uh, that is so complimentary. But I wanted to read a passage to you from the book A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens uh, to share with you the lovely, just absolutely delightful enthusiasm and gratitude that the Cratchit family had for the lovely dinner, lovely Christmas dinner that Mrs. Cratchit was making for her family. And I think that you'll enjoy this. If you're already familiar with the book, you, you probably know what I'm going to read. But if not, uh, I first of all, I just want to say I love this book. I love the story, A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. It's to me, in my humble opinion, one of the most beautiful stories of redemption uh, that I have ever read in terms of a fictional story. It's just very, very heartwarming, and I think that it is enjoyable for pretty much everyone in the family. Uh, and if you like movies, you've got to see the movie Scrooge, where Albert Finney plays Scrooge. It's a musical. It was made in, I believe, the 1970s. We love it. We watch it every year, and it never gets old. It's just a wonderful, wonderful movie. But let me go ahead and read to you this passage. Actually, let me get my bifocals <laughs> so that I can really do this reading justice. Such a bustle ensued that you may have thought a goose, the rarest of all birds, a feathered phenomenon, to which a black swan was a matter of course, and in truth it was something very like it in that house. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy, ready beforehand in a little saucepan, hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigor. Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce, Martha dusted the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner at the table. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves, and mounting guard upon their posts, crammed spoons into their mouths, lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped. At last the dishes were set on, and grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause as Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it into the breast. But when she did, and when the long expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose all around the board, and even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat on the table with the handle of his knife, and feebly cried, Hurrah! And it continues, There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there even was such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavor, size and cheapness, were the themes of universal admiration. So if you like A Christmas Carol and you tend to like frequenting used bookstores. You may come across this. This is an older book, but it has wonderful illustrations throughout. They're beautifully uh, colorful and the pages are a little on the shiny side. They're very, very nice. This is just a delightful book to have. And then this little gem I wanted to share with you, I found at a library sale and it's the Charles Dickens cookbook. And it basically has recipes from different foods that span the gamut of all the books that he wrote. And then this is something fun. This is called a book to table classic. And basically it contains the complete novel uh, of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. And then it has recipes for your holiday menu from various uh, famous chefs and home cooks. Martha Stewart has something in here. Uh, Trisha Yearwood, the country western singer, has something in here. And just different people like that. And it's more, they're more sharing, I think, the holiday recipes that they like. But you also have the reading of the book as well.
Well, I've been continuing to remove the rendered goose fat as the goose is cooking. And I just want to show you this glorious amount of fat that I've obtained so far. So I've moved on. I think I'll get enough to finish this smaller, or <laughs> fill this smaller jar once we're finished. But now I wanted to show you how to make this cherry sauce. And it's very easy. All you need is just get a small saucepan. And in here, I've got about two tablespoons of butter. Uh, this is not an exact science, so you don't have, you can kind of eyeball things if you want. But so I've got about two tablespoons of butter in there. I'm going to go ahead and pour in my one cup of port. And then what I've got here is a jar of Morello cherry fruit spread. It's got more fruit than sugar, so that's a good thing. But uh, there are also different types of cherry jams and cherry preserves out there. There's even one that's a sour cherry, if you like a little bit of a tang uh, to your sauce. But this Morel cherry, I think it's going to be quite lovely. And this is, un this is sort of unusual. This is a 17 ounce size jar. So if you have a 16 ounce jar or if you have a 12 ounce jar, it's going to be fine. And all you're gonna do is go ahead and just empty out your jar right into your saucepan. Now that I've got everything in my saucepan, I'm gonna go and put this over on my stovetop on low heat, and I'm gonna whisk it to get the butter melted and the port wine mixed in nicely with the cherry jam. And then I'm going to let it simmer on low until it reduces by about half. It may take you know, maybe about 30 minutes or so. But the secret is to make sure that you have it on a very low setting, the lowest setting. Uh, after you bring it up to a simmer, then just turn it down and get everything nicely mixed. Turn it down to the lowest setting on your cooktop. I even have a setting called melt, which is very low. And that works wonderfully for something like this. Well, I just took this glorious goose out of the oven and it looks wonderful. It's cooked to 170 degrees Fahrenheit, internal temperature. And so now I'm gonna get ready to plate it. I'll show you how I like to plate it up to serve it and we'll take a taste. Well, I've put this goose on my Christmas platter and I've surrounded it with those roasted potatoes and then I just sprinkled with the red skin roasted potatoes and then I sprinkled them with a little bit of chopped fresh flat leaf Italian parsley so we could kind of get the red and green Christmas theme going on. But this looks lovely. The Goose is cooked to perfection. Look at how this glorious stuffing is flowing out of the cavity. I think it's just going to be scrumptious. And I want you to hear, I'm gonna go with the mic a little close. I want you to hear this skin. Can you hear that? It's nice and crisp. I just have to turn this around and show you how pretty this is. I love how the sage and onion stuffing is just flowing out so bountiful. It just looks very Abu Danza, and you know I like that. And these roasted potatoes with a little bit of the parsley sprinkled on top really look lovely. Alrighty, well what I'm gonna do is slice into the breast so you can see exactly what the breast meat looks like cooked to 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Now I also want to mention, don't worry if you don't have a meat thermometer. If your goose is somewhere, you know, around nine to 10 pounds like mine, and you cook it stuffed for three and a half hours, chances are it will be done. You can give the leg a little jiggle and it'll feel loose and then you can make a little tiny incision. And if the juices run clear, you know you're set. Now I'm gonna overlay some pictures of this breast so that you can see it up close. And I think you'll be able to see that it's quite juicy. This is not the least bit dry at all. And if you've never had goose before, the breast meat in many ways is very similar to the dark meat on a turkey. It does have that darker and sometimes a bit of pink coloration to it. Now I've got this lovely cherry port wine sauce and I'm just going to go ahead and drizzle a little bit of this on the 
piece, the taste test that I'm going to take. Now, when it comes to this sauce, you can strain out the little bits of cherry if you want. I kind of like leaving them in. I think that it just gives the sauce a little bit of a nice texture, but that's totally up to you. Well, let's give this a taste. Mmm. Mmm. That's so tender, so juicy, so flavorful, and that cherry sauce really adds a wonderful taste. And today I'm continuing with my Christmas cooking series and I'm making easy yeast dinner rolls. And you can bake them in a cast iron skillet or you can just do them on a baking sheet, whatever you've got handy. They're very easy and they're fast too. The ingredients are very simple and probably things you already have on hand. All you're going to need is some active dry yeast, a cup of milk, a tablespoon of sugar, a half a teaspoon of salt, four tablespoons of butter, and about four and a half cups of bread flour. Now this is just white flour, it's just regular bread flour. Uh, this one is organic. Um, I bought it at my local grocery store and as most of you know I generally don't bake with white flour but during Christmas and New Year's that week it's kind of a little bets are off <laughs> when it comes to good nutrition I must be honest and uh, I do tend to that's when I do tend to uh, make a few breads and rolls and some cakes uh, with white flour so I just wanted to let you know but this is bread flour and it's just regular white bread flour that you can get at your grocery store. Well, I've got a ham baking in my oven right now, and I thought in the meantime I'd make these rolls because it's a nice thing to have as an accompaniment uh, with a ham, and it's perfect for a Christmas Day dinner. So I wanted to show you how to do these in the event that you'd like to make them uh, for your Christmas dinner. Now, I'm going to make them in a food processor. And as you can see, my food, I don't know if you can tell on camera, my uh, bowl is really beat up. I've had this one a really long time, but it's just a workhorse. I love it. And there's OB barking in the background. <laughs> But uh, if don't worry if you don't have a food processor, you can make these by hand. You can just need them probably take about 10 minutes. Um, you can also use an electric mixer with a dough hook if you've got that, or even one of those handheld electric mixers like I sh used when I made the mashed potatoes for Thanksgiving. Sometimes those come with a little dough hook. You can use that too. Um, so really this will work with anything. But what I like about the uh, food processor, if you've got one, this dough will come together literally in a minute. I'm not kidding. And it'll be ready to uh, put in a greased bowl and, and left to rise. Now this is whole milk and it's a little warm, about 110 degrees. And I'm just going to go ahead and pour this right into my food processor. And if you're doing it by hand or in an electric, mi you know, electric mixer, just put it in the bowl. And then I'm just going to add my package of active dry yeast. And this is another thing too, you know, I don't, don't use too much active dry yeast, but again, like I said, all bets are off during the holiday time. And you might remember that I said, uh, when I was talking about cookbooks, sometimes you just wanna have some, uh, you wanna throw in a package of yeast and make some bread. And that's pretty much how I feel during the holidays. And now I'm gonna go and add the sugar. And I'm just gonna let that, I'm gonna give it a little whirl and then just leave it to dissolve for a little bit. Well, I've got the yeast and the sugar dissolved in the milk, and now I'm going to add four tablespoons of butter, and then I'm going to add a half a cup. We're going to start with a half a cup of, of the bread flour. Put that right in there. And then I'm going to add the salt there on top of the butter, I mean, on top of the flour. And then I'm going to put this back on and start giving it a whirl, and we're going to add the flour a half a cup at, the, at a time until we get a nice dough. Now I just wanted to bring you in closer so you could see exactly what the dough looks like. This is at two cups of flour and I've put in a half a cup of flour at uh, each time and whirled it for maybe less than 10 seconds each time. And now I'm going to go ahead and put in another cup of, of bread, or ha, excuse me, half a cup. I've been putting it in a half a cup at a time. I'm going to put in another half a cup and get that off of there <laughs> and I'll put the lid back on whoops <laughs> we'll give it another whirl and 
We'll keep adding half a cup at a time until it's a it looks like a nice smooth dough that's pulling away from the sides. Well, it took about four cups of the flour and it's become just a beautiful, nice dough, uh, just soft and smooth. And now we're gonna take it out of the uh, food processor and put it in a greased bowl and let it rise for about an hour or an hour and a half. Well, I took the dough out of the food processor and it's just a beautiful dough. It's so smooth and it already smells delicious. And I've greased my bowl with some olive oil. I also wanted to let you know I greased my hands too when I went to take it out of the food processor. That just makes the whole process <laughs> easier. Now I'm just going to grease this all around. Give it a good greasing. Nothing sticks to the plastic wrap. And we're just going to set this aside now for about an hour, an hour and a half. We're just going to watch it till it uh, doubles in bulk. Now, if you're new to baking uh, bread or rolls or whatever the case may be, there are little um, containers. They're not really little, but there's plastic containers. I think... Uh, I think I've seen them the most in the King Arthur flour catalog and you may want to check that. If you're new to baking, they have these plastic containers that uh, show how much, you know, they have lines like for a dough this size and then a line showing what it would be once it had doubled in bulk and that kind of helps you learn and it's a nice little thing to do, you know, it's a nice little thing to have, I should say, um, to help you when you're trying to uh, deal with you know what exactly does that mean double in bulk and uh, so it's just a suggestion <laughs> already I'm going to go ahead and cover this with some plastic wrap put it in a warm place for an hour and a half and then we'll get ready to form it into 12 rolls well it looks like my dough has doubled in bulk and it's just beautiful now what we're going to do is I've greased my cast iron pan with butter. Now if you don't have a cast iron pan, that's no problem. You can also use a baking sheet and you'll just want to grease it before you put your rolls on it. Um, or you put it down a piece of parchment paper, that'll work great too. Now all we're going to do is just move this around a little. Oh, it looks great. And we're going to pull off, we're going to get about 12 uh, rolls out of this. And we're going to pull, want to pull off pieces that are about the size of an egg. And then we're just going to roll it up in our hands and we're going to put them down into the cast iron skillet. And if you're new to making rolls, I just want to show you, I've got five in my pan right now. And I just pulled up another one, you know, about the size of an egg. And what I like to do is just give it a little, little roll between my hands like this to give it some semblance of a shape. And then all I like to do is kind of pull it under, if you can see what I'm doing. Just pull it in under a little like that. And then just kind of pinch it underneath to bring it together. Just pinch it like that. That's going to be the seam. That's going to be the bottom. And just pinch it. Keep going like that. And then you got a nice little roll. And in she goes. So I'll show you again. Just pick up, pull off the piece of dough, about the size of an egg. I like to give it a little roll in my hands. My hands are well greased. And then I like to just kind of pull it under, a little under like that. Just sort of so that I'm making the top smooth. Do you see what I'm doing? Just kind of making the top smooth. And then just pulling all this together underneath I'm just pulling it together, like making a little little package. <laughs> and I just keep doing that until it looks the way I want it to, pulled together nicely with not too much of a seam. And I just keep doing that, working it like that. And then I have my nice little roll and I'll tuck, tuck it in here, be nice and cozy. <laughs> One more and then I'm done. Well, they're all done and I'm just going to cover them loosely, let them rise for another half hour in a warm place, and then they'll be ready to go into the oven. Well, I let the rolls rise for another half hour and they just look glorious. Look at these sweet babies. <laughs> they look so good. Alrighty. And that's my oven telling me it's just come up to temp. 425 degrees Fahrenheit and they're going to go in for about 20 minutes. Now I'm just going to brush these with a little water because water will give them a very crisp crust and that'll make them quite lovely and they'll be perfect 
for um, making little ham sandwiches out of. I cooked the ham today, and so we're anxious to, to enjoy these. I'm glad they only take about 20 minutes to bake, but this will give them a real nice crisp crust, bun crisp, it's hard to say, crisp crust <laughs> on top. And, you know, they're not perfectly rolled. I did my best when I was, or not, not that they're not perfectly rolled, but not perfectly sized. I did my best when I was dividing up the dough and trying to, uh, get the the 12 uh, rolls out of it but the, I've got some a little bigger than others but I don't think that really matters that's kind of the nice thing about it being homemade that you know it's not perfect doesn't look store-bought looks homemade and that's okay <laughs> alrighty so just want to give them a good good coating with the water it's gonna give them a real nice crisp crust and then after I do that, I'm going to take the knife and I'm going to score each of them in like a, a cross pattern. And the reason I'm going to do that is the minute they come out of the oven, I'm going to brush them with melted butter, four tablespoons of melted butter, and it's just going to absorb right into that cross on top of the roll. And then I'm going to sprinkle them with a little salt. They're going to be out of this world. Well, they were in the oven exactly 20 minutes and they look glorious scrumptious. <laughs> Alrighty, now I'm going to take the melted butter and I'm just going to paint them with this pastry brush and have all this wonderful butter soak in. Oh my gosh, they feel, oh look at that. Oh crispy, crispy top. It sounds nice and hollow. Ah, oh, this is just going to be wonderful. Well, I brushed all the butter on. It was four tablespoons melted into like every nook and cranny. And now I'm just going to sprinkle this with salt on top. And I wanted to mention, you know, you can also sprinkle it with crushed herbs as well. Um, and you can also mix herbs into the dough. It's very flexible. But the ham that I'm serving it with is just this delicious, sticky, gooey, orange marmalade, ginger glazed ham, and it's got so much flavor. So I kind of wanted to just keep the rolls a little on the simple side in terms of flavor so they didn't compete uh, with the lovely flavor of the ham. Alrighty, I think that's good. So I think I probably put about a half a teaspoon. I don't think I need the whole teaspoon. Alrighty, oh, that looks great. I'm just gonna let that butter soak in a little more and then we'll go in for a taste. Well, I'm definitely ready to have a taste test. So let me just cut one of these out. They're gonna just pull apart beautifully. You could even just kind of go all around and pop it out onto a plate and then straighten it back upright and uh, let everybody just pull a roll apart. Oh my gosh, this looks so good. It's very hot. I really should let them cool a little more. But I just want to show you, I don't know if you can see it, they're just like pillowy, pillowy soft. Oh, it's so warm. It'll be a little better once it cools. <laughs> but I just want to see if we can get in here. You can just see. Oh, look at that. Just pillowy soft. Alrighty, let's take a taste. You can see the steam coming off it. Mmm. Mm. Oh, it's so tasty with the butter and everything. <laughs> mm. Well, these will definitely be a hit on any holiday table, so I hope you'll give them a try. Today I want to share with you how to make a gingerbread cake. This is a lovely Christmas recipe and it's adaptable to using both all-purpose flour or whole grain flour and I'll show you how to make it both ways. Well the first thing that you're going to want to do is preheat your oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit and I believe that's around 180 degrees Celsius. The next thing you want to do is get a baking dish, any type of baking dish you have, but one that's about 8x8 eight eight or 9x9. Nine nine. And then you want to grease it and flour it well. Now if you want to make this gingerbread with whole grain flour, you're going to want one and a half cups 
of the whole grain flour of your choice. Now, I really like baking with spelt flour. It's an ancient grain and it's in the wheat family, but you can use anything that you like. You can use einkorn, emmer, spelt, uh, you can use traditional whole wheat that you see very commonly at the grocery store. You can also use white whole wheat, which is not all-purpose flour. It's actually a whole grain, a uh, whole wheat flour. It's just uh, from a hybrid, so to speak, of red wheat. Uh, and it's lighter in color, lighter in texture, and lighter in flavor. So any of those wheat flours will work. Now, if you wanna just make this with all-purpose flour, you're gonna to wanna to have two cups of all-purpose flour. Next, you're gonna need a quarter cup of sugar. Now, if you're baking this with all-purpose flour and you wanna use white sugar, that's fine. But I'm gonna use the whole cane sugar, it's sometimes sold under the name Sucanat. It's just the dried cane juice. I like the dried cane juice because it still has all the minerals and the vitamins in place and none of that's been stripped out. And this works very well when using a whole grain flour or an all-purpose flour. So we'll go ahead and add that right into our flour. Then we're going to need two teaspoons of ground ginger, one teaspoon of ground cinnamon, a quarter teaspoon of ground cloves, and a quarter teaspoon of allspice. Now you can also substitute nutmeg for the allspice if you like that more, but I really prefer the allspice. You're also gonna want a teaspoon of baking soda and a half a teaspoon of salt. And this is just a fine ground sea salt. So we'll get all of this into our flour. We'll also add our baking soda and we'll give this a good whisk just to make sure that everything is incorporated and spread well throughout the flour. And I'll have the printable recipe for all of this over on my website, marysnest.com. Next, you're gonna want one stick or eight tablespoons or half a cup of melted butter. And to the melted butter, we're gonna add three quarters of a cup of molasses. And this is just plain regular molasses. It's not the black strap. Then I'm just gonna give this a little whisk to incorporate the butter and the molasses together. Then we're gonna go ahead and pour in our butter and molasses mixture right into our flour. And now we're just gonna incorporate this molasses butter mixture just enough to moisten the flour. Next, we're gonna add a quarter of a cup of cold brewed coffee. Now, if you don't have this, don't worry. You can use water or if you want, you can make a quarter of a cup of instant coffee uh, with the little coffee granules. But this adds a lovely flavor. Next, you're gonna want one cup of buttermilk. Now don't worry if you don't have buttermilk. You can use one cup of regular milk and just put a little squirt of lemon juice in there to help curdle it. Or you can take some yogurt and thin it with milk to the consistency of buttermilk. Any of those options will work. But the nice thing about using buttermilk or a soured milk or a cultured milk, like if you had diluted the uh, yogurt, is that it gives a wonderful light texture to baked goods. So I highly recommend it. And it's especially helpful whenever you're baking with whole grains. It really helps with the lightness of the end product, of the final baked product. And now to your buttered milk or your soured milk or your thinned yogurt milk, we're gonna add one egg and that's a large egg. And then we're just gonna give this a little stir to incorporate that egg and we'll go ahead and pour this into our gingerbread mixture. And in goes that buttermilk egg mixture. And now I'm just gonna add a teaspoon of vanilla, well, maybe a little more. <laughs> I find that adds a nice flavor too. And this is my homemade vanilla extract. Uh, if you want to know how I make this, I'll put a link in the iCards and in the description below. It's very easy to do. Now we're just gonna mix this up until we get it into a nice batter, and it's gonna be a thick batter. Well, we've got everything ready. It's a glorious thick batter. You may see some lumps if you're doing this by hand like I am. Don't worry about it. You can just press them out a little with your spatula, but a few lumps is fine. This is gonna come out beautiful. Now we're just gonna go ahead and prepare and, and pour this right into our prepared pan. 
Now we'll get this into our 350 degree oven. We're going to bake this for between 30 and 35 minutes and you'll know that it's done when you check on it and you see that it's starting to pull away from the sides a little and a toothpick inserted into the middle comes out clean. Well, I just took this out of the oven and it took about 35 minutes and it smells glorious. Now we're going to let this cool in the pan for about 15 minutes and then we're going to take it out and we're going to have some fun decorating it. Well, I let this cool in the baking pan for about 15 minutes. So now we'll take it out and we'll let it cool the rest of the way on a rack. And I've got a nice cake plate here that once it's cooled, we'll put it up here. Uh, this actually belonged to my mom uh, that some of you who are in my age group may remember the green stamps that we used to get when you'd shop at the grocery store. And my mother would collect the green stamps and then she'd turn them in at the little green stamp store for different things. And this cake plate was one of the things that she picked out and I remember going with her. So it has a nice memory. And then, so I've got the cake plate, I've got a little doily on top and we'll take this out. Hopefully it'll come out perfectly. Boom. Yeah. Look at that. Excellent. Okay. Now we'll just let that cool completely and then we'll decorate it. Alrighty. Well, I let this cool a little more and now I'm going to take my doily, just put it down like that and then wish me luck as we get this onto this cake plate. Boom. Pretty good. <laughs> Thanks to the doily, it allows you to straighten it out easily. Now I've got some different uh, things here that are fun to use at Christmas time. I've got some deer. Uh, I've got some little holly with berries. Uh, I've got some little green trees. And then of course, Santa Claus with his reindeer. So we definitely have to put Santa Claus on and he'll, we'll put him just like this, maybe right to one side there. And then maybe I'll put some little trees and it's funny, nothing's to scale. These trees are a little small. I don't, I think I'll hold off and save these for cupcakes or something. These deer are a little big in comparison to the trees, but I like to put the trees on. I always think they look cute. And so I'll just get some of these around and then we'll dust the whole thing with powdered sugar. Well, I've got a few trees on there. Maybe I'll put some little holly in the front here. I think that'll look very cute and colorful. And I have to tell you that uh, this little uh, Santa Claus with the reindeer always has special memories to me because my son used to love to take this and put it on the roof of the manger in the nativity scene. So that was always very cute that Santa was there at the nativity. Now we'll dust everything with powdered sugar because even though I live in central Texas, it wouldn't be Christmas without a little snow on the gingerbread. Well, look at this charming little winter wonderland. Well, I think all your family and friends will enjoy this. I hope you enjoyed this holiday cooking marathon and are feeling inspired to make some of these delicious dishes for your holiday table. And from my family to yours, we wish you a very Merry Christmas and a happy, healthy, and blessed New Year. And I'll see you next year right here in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.